committee will come to order. I apologize, uh, one, uh, for keeping uh, both uh, my colleagues and our witnesses waiting. Uh, coming from a uh, breakfast meeting I was hosting for uh, Pennsylvania National Guard, and uh, it was, uh, while focused on uh, maybe military issues related to our discussion here today, in that uh, one of the takeaway points from the uh, acting um, Adjutant General of the PA Guard, General Craig, was uh, the bargain when we talked about trying to rein in spending and defense spending of uh, that the Army National Guard costs 5 percent of the total budget for the military, yet is 40 percent of the Army resources, uh, you know, combat resources, and uh, on the Air Guard, 7 percent of the budget and about a third of the Air Force resources. In other words, what a good bargain the Guard is when we try to wrestle with spending, how to deal with uh, the out-of-control spending that we uh, currently have. So a uh, different issue, but related to what we are going to talk about here today. Um, the Subcommittee on Government Organization Efficiency and Financial Management is uh, gathered here today to take a look at the fiscal year 2010 Consolidated Financial Report of the United States Government prepared annually by the Office of Management and Budget and Treasury uh, in conjunction with each other and audited by the Government Accountability Office. This hearing will set the stage for our oversight of executive branch financial management systems throughout the 112th Congress, examining both government-wide accountability issues and the fiscal implications of program spending decisions. The financial statements in the accompanying audit present two separate but equally important issues of concern for the subcommittee. First is the story told by the numbers themselves, what the statements reveal about our fiscal future. Second is the process by which those numbers are derived, what the audit shows in terms of how well the government keeps its books and demonstrates accountability. Unfortunately, we have another disclaimer of opinion for 2010, which has been the case since the audit, uh, uh, government-wide audit was first required. Uh, when I was chairman of this subcommittee from 2003 to 2006, we looked at this report every year, and the issues seem to be almost the same five to eight years later and the challenges that we are dealing with. Uh, we would like to make some progress over the next two years, particularly in the area of improving internal controls so that we can address the root causes of the problems that we are facing on the financial front. We would also like to bring more attention to financial management issues. At our first hearing, we were pleased to hear from members of a task force assembled by the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board to look at ways to improve the consolidated financial report. Today we are honored to have the auditor of the report as well as the authors. Um, we have with us the Honorable Jean Dudero, Comptroller General of the United States, um, with the Government Accountability Office, uh, which is responsible for conducting the audit and for establishing government-wide auditing standards and standards for internal control. And General Dudero, we are delighted to have you with you, and always great to have a fellow Pennsylvanians here, uh, here with us. Uh, also, we have the Honorable Daniel Orfel, the Comptroller and Director of the Office of Federal Financial Management, Office of Management and Budget. Uh, this office um, oversees financial management practices at Federal agencies and prescribes the form and content of agency financial statements. And finally, the Honorable Richard Gregg, First Assistant Secretary of the Department of the Treasury. Uh, Mr. Gregg's office is responsible for compiling the Consolidated Financial Report. Certainly thank each of you for being here today and, most importantly, uh, your written testimony you provided and gave uh, us a chance to look at ahead of time and your oral testimony here today as well as being one to take questions. Uh, the insights that each and every, uh, all of you have are so important to this subcommittee's work. And uh, we are not just glad to have you here today, but look forward to partnering with you uh, as we go forward over the next two years of this session in really um, doing our utmost to have the um, Federal Government be more accountable, more transparent, more efficient in how we use the resources of the American people. So thanks for your testimony. Uh, with that, I would like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, uh, former chairman of this subcommittee as well as the full committee, Mr. Towns, for uh, opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, this hearing on the issue of the Federal Government financial report for fiscal year 2010 is very timely and important, particularly as the body is working to finalize the Nation's budget. I thank you for holding it, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, of course, I noticed that some of the things that we are talking about and dealing with, it, we had them when I was chairman, then they had them when I was ranking, then had them when you were chairman. And I hope that we can get rid of them while I am ranking, because when I come back and I am chairman, I want these things to be gone. Uh, 
Two, two weeks ago, we held a hearing on how best to present the information contained in the Consolidated Financial Report. So that is clear and usable by Congress and the public. Today, we get into the details of what the financial report actually say about the financial conditions of this country. For 14 years in a row, GAO has been unable to give an opinion on the audit of the government's financial statements. As we have seen in the past, there are still serious financial management problems at the Department of Defense. There is a continuing problem with government agencies not reconciling their balance sheet for transactions they do with each other. And GAO is telling us that the process of preparing the government's financial statements is ineffective. GAO has been reporting these same problems to Congress year in and year out for more than a decade. Treasury reports that government agencies have greatly improved accounting for the transactions they do with each other. Happy to hear. Mr. Gregg's written testimony says that the balance sheet difference fell from $102 billion in FY 2009 to $40 billion in FY 10. This is encouraging and we are looking for continued improvement. I am also aware that some government agencies have made substantial improvements in preparing their financial statements. It is commendable that 31 out of 35 of the largest government agencies have received clean audit opinions from GAO. Others, it seems, have stood still, didn't move. The DOD still needs to invest significant time and personnel resources in improving its financial statements. It is good to note that OMB and Treasury are working with DOD to resolve some of its more serious accounting weaknesses. I have been hearing constant references to the shrinking window of opportunity for making policy changes. To meet our ongoing challenges in producing credible financial reports, we, will, we still have too much work to do. I hope that the window is not closed by now. I thank our panel of witnesses for their testimony and look forward to their observations of what further policy changes we can make and how we can improve the process of producing reliable financial statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that note, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Uh, would uh, any of the other members uh, like to make a, an opening statement? Thank you. Uh, record will be kept open for seven days if there is anything you want to submit in writing. Um, but uh, if not, um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I just have a, an opening statement to insert in the record. Okay. Without objection. I thank the Chair. Um, and with that, uh, General Dodaro, if you would like to begin. And uh, actually, if we uh, could have each of you rise for the oath. Uh, raise your right hand. Uh, each of you swear that everything you share, uh, actually, I will get the uh, actual words, uh, everything be uh, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, uh, so help you God. I do. So, yep. Thank you. Sorry about that. General Dodaro. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Towns, uh, Congressman Cooper, Connolly, and Gosser. It's uh, very uh, much of a privilege to be with you this morning to discuss the results of our audit of the 2010 financial statements of the United States government. I commend you, Mr. Chairman, and this uh, subcommittee for having this hearing. It is very important to make sure that there is sustained attention to looking at the status of the outcomes of the financial audits across the Federal Government every year. Now, this past year, as was mentioned in the opening statements, again at the government-wide consolidated financial statement level, GAO was unable to give an opinion on the accrual-based financial statements of the United States Government. There are three main reasons for that, serious financial management problems at the Department of Defense. Uh, the inability of uh, Federal agencies to properly account for intergovernmental activity and reconcile balances between agencies, and last, an ineffective process for preparing the consolidated financial statements. We have made many recommendations to Treasury and OMB. They have implemented many. They are in the process of implementing others. Uh, so we are hopeful that there is continued progress in addressing these weaknesses. 
Also, I would note in the 2010 statements, we were unable to give an opinion on the statement of social insurance, which in the prior two years we were able to. Uh, this was due to uh, management disclosures of significant uncertainties uh, underlying uh, the assumptions uh, in preparing those statements. Also, 2010 uh, was the unveiling of a new statement of sustainability which shows the Federal Government's fiscal path over a long period of time. This is something that is a, is a very good development and should aid the Congress and the citizens in uh, understanding the long-term path. Now, this report and statement uh, disclosed uh, similar to what was disclosed in GAO and CBO long-range simulations, that the Federal Government is on an unsustainable fiscal path uh, over a long period of time. And so we think this new statement of sustainability, along with the Citizen's Guide that has been prepared now for a while, will be added uh, education tools that can be used to help illustrate the serious financial challenges facing the Federal Government. Now, if you go down from the government-wide level to the agency financial statements, uh, the picture there is a bit more encouraging. Twenty of the 24 largest Federal departments and agencies in the Federal Government were able to obtain an unqualified opinion. Uh, that is up from six in fiscal year 1996, which was the first year that all departments and agencies across the Federal Government were actually required to prepare financial statements and to have them uh, audited. Uh, they have also been able to produce these statements on an accelerated time frame uh, and mo have moved now to being able to produce them 45 days after the close of the fiscal year, which is a good development as well. Now, in addition, our report points out a couple of material weaknesses across the Federal Government. One is the problem of improper payments. Uh, the current estimate in the report is at $125 billion. Uh, I am very encouraged, however, to report that by actions by the administration and the Congress and this committee's support through passage of the Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Act last year, there are efforts underway to tackle this problem. But it is probably going to get worse before it gets better because not all agencies and programs are reporting right now in the improper payments. But targets are being set, uh, accountability is being fixed. Uh, and I think this is a very important endeavor, particularly given the serious challenges we have facing uh, our Federal Government uh, and from fiscal pressures. Uh, in addition, you have a $290 billion tax gap between taxes owed and taxes collected. So these areas are important for the Federal Government to tackle going forward. Uh, so in summary, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that it is very important uh, for sustained attention to be made uh, by the Congress. And I would encourage this committee to have uh, continuing uh, hearings on these subjects. You know, we just updated our high risk list and testified before the full committee. A couple areas come off the list, but the lesson learned is through high level attention by the departments and agencies, but sustained congressional oversight. Progress is possible. Uh, it is needed. And given the fiscal pressures facing our nation going forward, I believe financial management needs to be a top priority of the administration and the Congress. I thank you for your time and attention. I would be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, General Dodaro. Mr. Werfel. Thank you, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, Congressman Cooper, Congressman Connolly, and Congressman Gosar, and other members of the subcommittee for the invitation to be here today to discuss the Consolidated Financial Report of the United States and uh, Federal Financial Management. Improvements in financial management are paramount to the effective stewardship of taxpayer dollars. The annual results of agency financial statement audits are an important indicator of progress in carrying out our stewardship responsibilities effectively. For the past several years, the vast majority of Federal agencies have achieved an unqualified or clean opinion on their annual financial statements, and auditor-identified weaknesses across the government have been steadily declining. As Mr. Dodaro just pointed out, uh, in fiscal year 2010 was somewhat of a high watermark for us in terms of uh, 20 of the 24 major CFO Act agencies achieving a clean opinion. Also worth noting that we reported 31 
auditor identified material weaknesses across government. When you compare that to the 61 material weaknesses that were reported in 2000, you see that steady progress was made across the last decade. Mr. Dodaro also pointed out that all major agencies are meeting the 45-day deadline for producing audited financial statements, a time frame that actually exceeds the official statutory deadline of financial reporting by more than 100 days. Of course, although we are making great progress, not all of our financial audit goals have been met. In particular, four agencies did not achieve a clean opinion in fiscal year 2010, which in part led to the disclaimer on the government-wide financial statements. Our office is committed to working with those agencies to make the necessary improvements in financial reporting practices so that all agencies achieve acceptable results on their annual audits. While audit results signal financial management success in many areas, there are critical financial management objectives not currently evaluated or addressed through standard financial statement audit activities. Informed by recent discussions surrounding the 20-year anniversary of the CFO Act and my experience as the day-to-day -day leader of Federal financial management efforts across government, I believe there are three improvements to our financial reporting model that represent the greatest opportunity to drive bottom-line results for taxpayers. First, improving reporting on where Federal taxpayer dollars are spent. Second, instituting stronger internal controls to mitigate government waste and error. And third, increasing access to reliable information on the cost of agency operations. As highlighted in my written testimony, while the current financial audit process does not address these issues directly or comprehensively, the administration and the Federal financial management community are focused on improving results in these areas. In particular, through the Accountable Government Initiative launched by this administration, we are preventing and increasing the recoveries of improper payments, eliminating unneeded real estate, turning around underperforming technology modernization projects, creating performance benchmarks for improved financial operations, and providing unprecedented transparency into Federal spending. Important early results are being achieved. I thank Mr. Dodaro for recognizing the efforts that the Executive Branch is undertaking to attack the improper payments problem. In fiscal year 2010, we saw a decrease in the overall government-wide improper payment rate, and that decrease helped prevent $3.8 billion in improper payments that would have otherwise been made. Also, Federal agencies recaptured $687 million in improper payments made to contractors and vendors. That is a 300 percent increase in recoveries from the prior year, fiscal year 2009. Despite this progress, more work and tools are needed to address improper payments. I think it is important for me to note that the President's 2012 budget recognizes this and includes in that budget a suite of program integrity pro proposals that, if enacted, would result in over $160 billion in savings over 10 years. I would like to also mention that the President's budget includes a bold new proposal related to civilian real estate. In 2010, the President directed agencies to accelerate efforts to realign civilian real property and save $3 billion by FY 2010. The President's new proposal builds on the success so far and expands that savings opportunity to $15 billion. This is achieved through the creation of an independent board that will make recommendations for up or down vote by Congress on the elimination or consolidation of excess Federal civilian assets, including realignment and streamlining of agency field offices. In sum, we have built a foundation of strong accounting practices, internal controls, and reporting processes that are leading to better audit results. This has positioned us to achieve better bottom line results in terms of error reduction and cost efficiencies. But our work is not done, and I am confident that we will continue to drive critical improvements in all areas of Federal financial management. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Werfel. And before I go, Mr. Gregg, uh, we are delighted and honored to be joined with the full committee chairman, Mr. Issa. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gregg. Thank you, Chairman Platts, uh, Ranking Member Towns, members of the subcommittee, for inviting me to testify today on the financial report for fiscal year 2010 and the audit. Uh, your interest in improving financial management is greatly appreciated. The financial report is prepared from all of the financial statements of the 35 largest Federal agencies and other information provided by more than 100 smaller independent agencies. In fiscal year 2010, 
31 of the largest agencies earned unqualified or clean audit opinions in their financial statements. For fiscal year 2010, as Jean had mentioned, the GAO was again unable to express an opinion on the government-wide financial statements, including the statement of social insurance. The disclaimer on the remainder of the statements stems from three longstanding material weaknesses. First, serious financial reporting issues at the Department of Defense. Second, the government's inability to adequately account for and reconcile intergovernmental activity and balances between agencies. And third, the government's deficiencies in the process for preparing the consolidated financial statements. I will cover a few key issues included in the financial report, and following that, I will talk about some of the financial management improvements we are working on with, with OMB and, and other agencies. As noted in the financial report, the government's budget deficit for fiscal year September 30, 2010 decreased slightly from $1.4 trillion to $1.3 trillion. On an accrual basis, the government net operating costs for the fiscal year 2010 increased from $1.3 trillion to $2.1 trillion, due primarily to substantial increases in estimated actuarial costs for veteran benefits and government employee programs, which are not reflected in the budget deficit. The government's recorded total assets of $2.7 trillion and, and total liabilities of $16 trillion comprise largely of $9 trillion in debt held by the public and $5.7 trillion in Federal employee and veteran benefit liabilities. The financial report also discusses the long-term fiscal challenges of funding Social Security, Medicare, and other social insurance programs. The government's financial statements currently project a social insurance shortfall of $31 trillion over 75 years. The important message conveyed in this year's report is consistent with previous years that the sooner action is taken to, re recon to resolve these shortfalls, the smaller the revenue increases and or spending decreases necessary to return the, the Nation to a fiscally sustainable path. The Department of Treasury, in cooperation with GEO and OMB, issues an annual Citizen's Guide, and this 10-page document utilizes user-friendly graphs and charts to provide a summary of the financial report's key information to the public. I would like to now talk about a number of initiatives that we have taken over the, the past year to improve this report and financial management in general. We have reduced differences in transactions between agencies in fiscal 2010 from $102 billion to $40 billion on an absolute value basis. We have reduced the number of GAO audit findings from over 150 to 52 in fiscal year 2009. OMB, Treasury, and DOD are focusing on a few key areas to resolve with DOD accounting and processes. We will then move on and broaden the scope of, of the work with DOD. Another issue we are working on is creating a general fund. And this, this fund will provide dual entry accounting for some of the central government activities. And this was not included in the, in the uh, accounting system that we have developed over the years. This has been a, a, a gap, in my view, of, of the accounting process, and we are in the process of filling that gap. Treasury is also expanding the government-wide electronic invoice portal that will enable government agencies and vendors to improve, control, streamline purchases, and reduce costs. <clears throat> we are also working with OMB and agencies to develop a system and a process that will resolve longstanding differences in transactions when one agency does business with another. Also, Treasury has, in the last six months or so, has expanded the use of electronic transactions for payments, savings bonds, and tax collections. These three initiatives, when fully implemented, will save $600 million over the first five years. We have also taken steps to sharply increase the debt collection within Treasury. We are looking to expand that to at least $5 billion over the next 10 years. In a couple of days, you will have a hearing with uh, Commissioner Liebrich on debt collection. And finally, Treasury is supporting OMB to reduce improper payments by establishing and supporting the administration's verifypayment.gov portal to prevent ineligible recipients from receiving payments from the Federal Government. Treasury looks forward to continue its good working relationship with OMB and GEO and the agencies to make further improvements in financial management reporting and financial management in general. That concludes my statement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gregg. <clears throat> and uh, we do look forward to 
or hearing on Friday on uh, debt collection and, and working closely with uh, Treasury and their, your uh, recommendations of changes in law that may be necessary to uh, strengthen uh, debt collection efforts. Um, we will begin a, a questioning round of five minutes each and, and uh, I think hopefully we will have time to come back around for a second time. Um, I am going to begin uh, with the um, um, I guess the, the big picture and, and you know, the issue of sustainability and the statement of sustainability, a, a kind of a new addition here to the CFR. Yes. And um, the um, you know, very stark statement, General Dodaro, that you included in your, your written statement that um, we cannot sustain the level of public debt that we are taking on, driven by a number of issues, demographics and medical costs in particular. Um, in the big picture, and I, I think I know the answer you are going to give, but don't want to put words in your mouth, when we look at that issue of sustainability of the direction we are heading um, and the amount of debt we have and are taking on um, without significant changes, what would be the um, number one recommendation that you think we as a Congress should be looking at to change that trend, that debt level trend, uh, to get us back onto a sustainable level? Uh, what Category spending or area, and you know what is your you know, most in, uh, important recommendation? The um, size of this problem is so large that the government has to look at entitlement spending, revenues, and discretionary spending. Everything needs to be looked at in the federal budget and dealt with in order to bring this problem under control. Uh, and I, I think you know, it is being driven largely by rising uh, spending and health care costs and, and demographic changes, as you point out. Those are the primary drivers. But the solution uh, is something that needs to be holistically looked at across the spectrum of the Federal Government's activities. If that is not done, this will not be solved. It, um, is, is it accurate for me to say, though, that, and I agree with everything has to be on the table and, and looked at to, to be more uh, responsible in our spending. But um, the um, uh, specific issue of entitlements that, given that they are now roughly two-thirds of our expenditures, uh, that while we can make improvements in discretionary uh, across the board, including defense, that unless we get our hands around entitlements and specifically Medicare spending, that everything else will almost be for naught if we don't deal with that issue. Uh, that is correct. I mean, entitlement spending has to be dealt with in order to deal with this problem. It is the primary driver uh, behind the uh, cost increases and needs to be an effective part of the solution if there is going to be a material change in this uh, path. You know, I start this. The, um, given, given the importance of entitlements, and, and a question actually to all three of our witnesses, um, one of the uh, other significant concerns I have with the um, consolidated financial reports is the uh, disclaimer on the statement of social insurance. Um, it, given how important getting our hands around entitlement spending is to fiscal sanity, um, that we have a, um, a statement of social insurance that really um, I think we all agree is, is um, not an accurate reflection of, uh, of the cost of Medicare in particular because of the assumptions that were uh, made regarding Medicare costs going down in response to the health care bill passed uh, just over a year ago. Uh, if all three of you could address that and how um, uh, you look at those assumptions and the accuracy or, or inaccuracy of the assumptions made in the Statement of Social service, um, Insurance. Uh, basically, uh, we start with reviewing the report by the uh, Social Security uh, Medicare trustees. And in that report, the trustees disclosed a number of uncertainties with regard to the cost assumptions, particularly in the Medicare area. This isn't quite true in Social, Social Security. Uh, and uh, the uncertainties uh, settled on uh, a couple of key factors, uh, one being whether or not the scheduled reductions in uh, cutting back the uh, payments to Medicare providers was going to take place as scheduled over a period of time. It was about a 30 percent reduction over a 30-year period was assumed. And, of course, as we know, Congress last year 
uh, you know, the, the deferred that scheduled the payment reduction by the, the first year, during the first year. Uh, second, there are assumptions in the estimates about productivity gains that would be enhanced by other providers in the system, and there is real uncertainty as to whether or not those productivity improvements will be realized at the size they are estimated and, more importantly, sustained over a period of time. So given that those uncertainties, the auditors for HHS, which originally looked at the, the statement of social insurance, disclaimed an opinion, and we agreed with that decision and uh, sustained that uh, on our statements. Yep. Mr. Werfel. Chairman, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I, the first thing I want to point out in response is that I, I would, I would argue that historically accounting and the process that we have gone through has looked back on the previous year or years, and, and, uh, and the effort is to capture the transactions, capture the value of our assets, the value of our liabilities. What we are entering into now with things like the Statement of Social Insurance and the Statement of Fiscal Sustainability is forward-looking accounting where we are doing projections. And some of the projections here, as noted, are 75 years into the horizon. And that creates additional uh, elements of uncertainty when you are looking to uh, establish metrics and measures that looking are out over a 75-year horizon. So I think that it is uh, to be expected that, uh, that as uh, uh, the trustees or HHS or others uh, look to assess these values, that they are going to have uh, qualifying statements and concerns about some of those uncertainties. And when you apply the auditor's scrutiny to that, what, what typically is looking backwards at, at whether the books are kept um, to looking forward to a 75-year projection, there, I believe there are going to be times where those uncertainties are going to kind of cross a threshold and create an uncomfort level, a discomfort level for the auditor in order to render opinion. And there will be times where those uncertainties will not cross that threshold. I think the last two years, the uncertainties did not cross that threshold. And what that tells me is that the process that we have, the process that HHS and Social Security and the other agencies undergo to develop their tables, to develop their numbers, to report this information is generally sound. But there will be moments in time where those uncertainties exceed a threshold by which the auditors don't feel comfortable rendering an opinion. I would, I would urge that the values that are reported still have value. Uh, and they still should be looked at closely and considered by Congress. But I think that we uh, have to recognize that when you get into the business of auditing statements that are projecting 75 years into the future, you are going to run into situations where issues of uncertainty affect the audit opinion. Mr. Gray. Mr. Chairman, the, uh, I think we pointed out a number of times in the, uh, in the fiscal sustainability area that they were not projections. They were really mathematical extrapolations, I think it is important to uh, uh, keep that in mind that, that uh, you know, they, I think that is what they are and they are based, based on, on the math, not saying this is what we think is going to happen. On the, uh, the trustee report, I think a couple of things there that I would just add to what Danny said is that, first of all, it is a huge piece of legislation. and trying to figure out what is going to happen 75 years out is, is uh, uh, very difficult. And secondly, I think as a result of when it was passed, there was uh, not as much time as the, the uh, actuaries normally have to, to assess everything. I think those are, were factors. Uh, having said that, it, it does look like that uh, the uh, HHS uh, actuary did a uh, uh, another il illustrative uh, sample of what, what the, uh, the cost might be. And looking at that, the, the savings are, are still very considerable. So the, uh, uh, I think, and, and just to reiterate what Danny said, I think the process that, that the Medicare and Social Security trustees go through in, in having accurate data uh, has been uh, there for several years. And, and I think that uh, we will get back, I, at least I hope we get back to a, a clean opinion for, for that report in the years ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gregg. And before I yield to the uh, Ranking Member, um, 
the, the one aspect of that, and I appreciate when you are talking 75 years and, and, and projections or extrapolations, but um, you know, that a, a key part of those assumptions were a 30 percent reduction in provider reimbursements, which we have never done and every year, and uh, historically the record shows we won't do that as we did not in the very first year. We didn't even make it one year without reversing that legislation. Um, given that reversal, my hope is that when the Statement of Social Insurance is issued for 2012, uh, a year from now, or less than a year from now, that um, HHS is going to look at what did occur and that those savings were not achieved in those provider reimbursements and are not likely to ever be achieved, and so that we get a more realistic uh, understanding of where Medicare stands. Because until we, unless we are realistic and honest about Medicare, we will never be honest about our fiscal picture and truly getting our hands around this, uh, this challenge. And if there is something brief, I am way over my time in General Dodaro. Yeah, I just want to add that, you know, while there are various alternative uh, assessments and, uh, per, you know, projections, if you will, or simulations, under any scenario over the long range, it is not sustainable. Yep. And I think we shouldn't overlook that point where well, we can well debate stated. the numbers and timing. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Towns? Mr. Chairman, I am prepared to yield to the well, he is no longer here. Okay. I was getting ready to yield to the chairman of the uh, full committee, but he disappeared. Okay. Because yeah, I am sensitivity to that chairmanship thing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me um, begin. First of all, <clears throat> I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, the Federal Government made $125 billion in improper payments in FY10. Uh, some of these payments were overpayments and some were underpayments. Some were made without sufficient documentation to support them, and some should not have been made at all. In recent years, Federal agencies have been given more tools to deal with improper payments. And, of course, um, uh, Congress passed the Improper uh, Payments Elimination and Recovery Act in 2010. OMB has issued guidance as well. Even though not all improper payments are an indication that fraud is taking place, uh, the potential for fraud, waste and abuse remains extremely high. Uh, Mr. Gregg, with the law on your side and all the guidance, why are the improper payments continuing to increase every year? I'll, uh give my answer and, and defer to, to OMB to, to some extent. Uh, it's, you know, we're, we're making, just Treasury alone makes a billion payments a year on behalf of agencies and, and the, uh, you know, the, the pressure to, to get everything done accurately and timely is, is uh, tremendous on the agencies and, and Treasury. At the same time, I, I think we, we can and, and we are doing a lot more. Uh, until fairly recently, under the, the uh, direction of OMB, uh, we, we really hadn't had agencies start doing uh, business intelligence assessment of, of going into their, their payment files and looking for, for potential problems before the payments reach Treasury. And I think that's, that's a very Im important step. There, there are tools out there that we just haven't been, been using fully, and I think that that uh, we are working on that with OMB to, to get those tools in place to go work with the agencies to do pilots to say, you know, what, what are the potential here for it? some of it may be fraud, some, some of it is also uh, just, just errors, but being able to identify those through sophisticated analytic tools. The other thing we are doing on, on that uh, Dave Liebrich will talk about in, in, uh, on Friday is, is on the debt collection side. We're looking to do the same thing. Uh, we're looking at at the debt portfolio that we have and and trying to to identify uh, how best to uh, to find those those debtors and go out and collect the money, even though the the payments have already been out and the and the debt debt is there. We're looking for ways to use better tools that we uh, now have available to uh, find people who who owe the government money to to uh, determine whether or not. Uh, someone is who they. Uh, we may have a file from a, from an agency that says someone's name is is John McDonald, 
and our debt file may say Jack McDonald. We now have tools that will, will help us identify whether or not that is the same person. We obviously don't want to try to collect a debt that, that uh, is known by someone, but through those tools we are going to be able to really hone in and say, yes, that is in fact the same person. So I think there is a lot going on, and, and I would defer to, uh, to Danny Werfel for, for more on the improper payments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Gregg, and thank you, uh, Congressman Towns. Um, I would start by saying that um, uh, progress is, is being made. Uh, the error rates in key programs are going down, and they are going down at the government-wide level. The, the challenge and the mathematical reality is as outlays outpace those error rate reductions, the error total grows. Um, and so we are up to $125 billion, but we are up to $125 billion in an environment where the Medicare error rate went down, the Medicaid error rate went down, the Social, uh, uh, key Social Security program error rate went down, uh, and the list goes on. Um, and so one of the things to reflect is, the, is to understand that, math, that, I think, that important mathematical nuance to, uh, to understand the progress that is being made. Uh, but also it raises how important this is, because as more money goes out the door, it raises the stakes for how important it is to get these payments right, because you know, a 1 percent error when $100 is going out is very different than a 1 percent error when $1,000 is going out. And that is the situation we have right now. More money is going out the door, even though the error rates are declining, the improper payment amount goes up. Why is this happening? We, we are doing uh, I think, a better and better job of understanding what makes up our errors. In some situations, you still have agencies making basic mistakes. It is within their direct control, at, and they should, in, in the immediate term, be able to take steps to better uh, address the errors, whether the payments are going to clearly ineligible individuals, whether they have been suspended or debarred, uh, or, or something that is very basic. But in many situations, Congressman, the the uh, effort to identify whether someone is eligible for a payment is extraordinarily complicated and involves a variety of different factors. And when you go down and audit that payment, you find that mistakes are made. I think a good example of that is the earned income tax credit, which has the highest error rate of any program. The uh, eligibility characteristics for someone to be eligible for the uh, earned income tax credit are very challenging. For example, an individual has to have lived with their dependent child for more than six months. We don't have a global childhood residency database to validate that. And we find a lot of improper payments occur when we go down an audit and find they didn't live with their dependent child for more than three months or something of that kind. So part of the challenge is finding those third-party data sources and figuring out better ways to validate eligibility. That is really, if I could boil it down in one, um, in one bullet or one phrase, the real challenge we have is how can we do a better job than we are doing today validating eligibility when those eligibility assessments are very complex? Right. Let me just uh, ask this, Mr. Chairman, uh, for, um, you know, you can sort of understand in terms of the dealing with the public and private sector. But when government agencies deal with each other, it seems to me that we should be able to correct this and uh, be able to uh, move forward. Is there anything else that we need to do? I am talking about the Congress. And, well, first, if I could just jump back to improper payments, I mentioned in my testimony and my, and my oral and both my written that in the President's budget, we have a suite of proposals that relate to driving down improper payments in key programs in Social Security, HHS, IRS, and labor that, if enacted, we believe would save $160 billion over 10 years. And so the first thing would be to call your attention to those provisions and ask for help in getting them enacted. In terms of the intergovernmental transactions, um, I, I think that the process that we have today for accountability has driven us to be on the precipice of a solution. It is a, a chronic material weakness that, uh, that GAO has identified as a key source of our disclaimed opinion, um, and, and we have had fits and starts over the years in defining a solution. But with, uh, with Mr. Gregg's leadership, uh, solutions are emerging right now. Uh, for improvements on intergovernmental transactions. And so what I would ask of the Congress is to continue to call us before you and hold us accountable. I am telling you now that I believe we are on the precipice of a solution that is going to drive significant improvements and, and call me back and, and, and hold me to that commitment. Right. 
uh, Congressman Towns, I just would, would add to uh, Mr. Werfel's statement that uh, I think one of the issues on the intergovernmental, uh, and I was here when we did the first uh, audit financial statement a number of years ago. And I was here then, too. Then, then went away. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think, you know, we, we, we in, in Treasury felt that it, it should be able to correct itself and with the agencies, and, and I came to the realization with uh, my staff last year that it is not. And so I made a commitment that, that someone needs to take responsibility for this to develop a system and a process and a small team of, of accountants to work with the agencies when there are differences. And, and if, if we can't solve this, then we ought to pack up our bags and go home, because this, as the saying goes, is not rocket science. It is not easy, but it, but it is certainly not rocket science, and we should get this fixed. I agree with you, Mr. Gregg. Thank you. On that note, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Uh, Dr. Gosar? <clears throat> Mr. Werfel, um, you referenced the percentage of mispayments and fraud. I actually question the accuracy of those numbers, because these are self-reported numbers. And as a businessman, I understand how those things can be skewed, particularly the statistics and the accuracy of those numbers. So I also believe in a checks and balance system, and especially when we are grasping accurate numbers for policy assumptions, where entities like Congress, the American people, the CBO, misled when calculating the cost of PAPACA or Obamacare, as we know it, by using bad accounting methods. I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure is what, uh, what me, your question is. Let me reiterate. Were entities like Congress, the American people, and the CBO misled when calculating the cost of PAPACA, which is Obamacare, utilizing bad accounting methods? No, I don't, think, uh, I don't think they were misled. I think one of the important things that we do when we report uh, our financial reports and our estimates is we uh, report with that all the assumptions that were made, uh, and those assumptions can be challenged. This is a this is a somewhat of a thick book, and it's thick because there are footnotes and alternative analyses and alternative presentations. And uh, I think that what we have empowered is a situation where academics, think tanks, members of Congress, and GAO can debate these numbers, uh, and and have a healthy dialogue about whether. The estimates and the projections and the extrapolations that are being reported are, are valid. And hopefully, uh, if there is enough information to challenge these numbers, then that debate will, will come to the fore. Uh, uh, and that is really our job. And I, I, I consider that my mission at OMB is to make sure that whatever we are reporting, that our assumptions, our underlying assumptions are clear so that, uh, so that experts and others can. can fairly criticize them and hold them under a, a light and, and debate their, their reliability. Well, it really becomes a he said, she said without a, an authority in the middle. And so with that said, um, how do you do the accountability for the new 68 nebulous um, discretionary grants as described in HHS policy? I need a clarification on the question. How do we do the accounting of, of How do you what do accounting on, on the new 68 nebulously uh, written discretionary grants as described in Health and Human Services policy in that bill? How do you account for that? Well, it depends on the, uh, on the what you are asking about those dollars. Are you asking about uh, if the discretionary grants, uh, you know, well, let's go for. Let's, I mean, you know, it, it, let's go for. Appropriation should be clear in terms of what its amounts are. Uh, the question then becomes: what uh, what information about those dollars are you interested in understanding? And then I can talk more about how they might be accounted for. Well, let me make sp more specifics. It says it says can use such sums as necessary. How do you do accounting for that? Well, the accounting, the accounting statements that we are reporting on today, for the most part, look backwards at what the agencies uh, spent. And so we have uh, financial systems, automated systems that, uh, that help us track which money from, uh, from HHS goes to which grantee 
Uh, and we can tell you uh, on a, uh, almost to a daily basis exactly how much money has gone out the door. If you are asking how much would be spent in the future uh, by a particular grantee, that is not something that we, uh, we estimate in the financial statements. They are considered uh, an appropriation that would be looked at in the budget, uh, but predicting how much of that appropriation would be spent is not something that I am aware we put a report so out. So you couldn't score it? Well, you could certainly look at, if it is an appropriated amount, you could certainly understand what the limit is. You can't go above the appropriated amount. So you would know, uh, you know, you would know the ceiling, but you might not know where you might but, fall under that ceiling. But by definition, it says such sums necessary. And, and, and I, I want to take it down to the, the provider level. You know, you can skew numbers any which way. For example, in dialysis, we are actually withholding payment from dialysis patients to show better numbers, you know, on self-reporting numbers. This is where the fraud is, and we can't even get a grip on this. What we need to be able to do is have numbers that are apples to apples for comparison. And if Congress can't get this, neither can the American people. And we can't even look at what agencies look at. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I question even the reality of what these numbers actually are. Do you understand my frustration here? I, I, in the area of, of, of Medicare fraud and, and improper payments, I uh, could not agree with you more. We have a, a, a significant problem, a, an estimate that exceeds $60 billion, and it is unacceptable. Uh, I can sit here today and tell you that the, the error rates are trending down, but I can't say that it is we are at an acceptable level. So I completely agree with and your it's not just And it is not just those mispayments. It is also misuse from the agency itself in not paying out uh, providers and hospitals and patients. It is on the same aspect. It is not just mispayments. It is withholding of payments. Well, now you are you're venturing into a programmatic area that I don't have familiarity with, so I apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gosar. Uh, Mr. Cooper? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the witnesses for being here. At a time when record numbers of Americans are questioning the Federal Government's ability to manage its own affairs, it is kind of amazing that this hearing, in one of the smallest, hardest to find rooms on the Capitol Hill, <laughs> that is not even covered by C SPAN 3. You know, this is a missed opportunity for anyone who is concerned about the future of the Federal Government, because what you gentlemen are discussing is, in my opinion, the most comprehensive report on how the Federal Government is doing. It is the only one that uses real business accounting, so-called accrual accounting. That is not cruel. It just tries to take into account what is on the government credit card, which Lord knows every family, every business, every government needs to focus on. So it is amazing to me when people are concerned not only about government finances but their own <coughs> personal finances, and people worry about the stocks that they are holding in the stock market, and they look at the annual report they get from a company. And here you gentlemen have worked hard to present a report to the American people, even with its own handy citizen's guide, to make it extra easy for people to understand. People are getting their favorite company's annual report. Somehow they don't even know their favorite country's annual report exists. What we're discussing here today is one of the best kept secrets in America. To my knowledge, there's not one businessman I've ever met who knows this report exists. There's not one business lobby that makes this a priority to focus on this. There's not one newspaper in America that regularly uses accrual accounting to describe the situation we're in. And this is an amazing, uh, well, it's a missed opportunity for my friends in the other party, because the first plank of the Republican contract with America was no more hi congressional hypocrisy. We should play by the same rules we require of the regular citizens. And regular businesses of any size have to use real accounting, but not the Federal Government. So why aren't we holding ourselves up to the private sector standard? You know, so um, you gentlemen know this already because you're accounting experts, and it's hard for you sometimes to translate your knowledge to uh, average members. But in response to Dr. Gosar's question, I would urge him to look at the conclusion section of the Citizen's Guide, Handy Citizen's Guide, which says two very helpful sentences here. 
The United States took a potentially significant step towards fiscal sustainability in 2010 by enacting the ACA, what he chooses to call Obamacare. It also says the legislated changes for Medicare, Medicaid, and other parts of the health care system hold the prospect of lowering the long-term growth trend for health care costs and significantly reducing the long-term fiscal gap. And that should be our primary job here on the Hill, to lower the fiscal gap. Now, accounting will never be perfect. It is just an approximation of what goes on. But this is the best report we have got, and very few people know about it. So I look forward to the first lobbying group in Washington celebrating and spreading this report. I look forward to the average Rotarian back home being able to access and know about this report. And it is true, it is available on the web. But nobody knows when they are reading the Wall Street Journal every day, as I did this morning, that they are reporting cash numbers only. So they really don't know what is on the national credit card, and I think they are entitled uh, to know that. So uh, I, there are many things we could go into into the details of your report. I am thankful that you gentlemen prepare this report, and you sometimes get grief and misunderstanding when you do it. Uh, let us work on improving uh, the mistaken payments. Let us reduce that to the bare minimum. You gentlemen are working hard on that already. But the key thing is here not to miss the big picture. That this is a more important look at the Federal Government than probably any other document. And most, if you were to poll members of Congress, most of them have never read it, have never heard of it, and don't know its significance, even though they guard their investments you know, pretty carefully and care about which stocks they invest in. Well, this is our only country, and we need to make sure that the American people are aware of this, because in simple terms, uh, the deficit, if you want to call it, of course, the proper term here is net operating cost, is much higher than the cash number. And it is higher for some very specific reasons, and reasons that aren't necessarily fun to go into, because a lot of that discrepancy has to do with veteran spending and military retiree spending and civil service spending and things like that, that using traditional cash measures we are not keeping up with. We are not admitting what is on our credit card. So, I hope we can work together to increase the prominence of this report, increase its accuracy, and let's make this uh, even more of a gold standard than it is already today. And I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. The release of it, and uh, again raising awareness, and and also, Mr. Cooper, um, I know in the past you've uh, introduced legislation regarding accrual accounting, and uh, you know, share with you today that I, I'd like to work with you this session on the possibility of reintroducing that legislation because I think it is we need to hold ourselves to the same standards that we're holding state, and local governments, and the private sector to. So, uh, yield to uh, Mr. Langford for questions. Thank you very much. Do want to just be able to follow up a little bit? There was a conversation with Mr. Werfel earlier about uh, you know a lot of focus on looking forward in the next 75 years, and it is a challenge to be able to look back and try to do both simultaneous on that. I will continue to emphasize the importance of being able to look back for the accountability side of that is a very big deal while we are busy looking forward to seeing what is happening next, which is important for all of us. 
uh, accountability, we have got to know what was just behind us. And uh, so we are able to be able to do our task as well and, uh, and to learn the lessons uh, that we have seen behind us. Your report is very good in being able to mention uh, several items that are up on it. Uh, I don't know if we have mentioned before the real property comments that you made in it. Uh, extrapolate a little more on what you anticipate as far as the release of some of these properties, the jobs that are related to those, and how we begin to transition from a piece of property that is underutilized or not utilized at all uh, to having that then gone. What do you see as the process? Well, today, the uh, thank you for the question, Congressman Langford. Um, we have a, an area of there, there are many areas of inefficiency and waste in government that we're looking to attack, and the uh, the real estate holdings of the federal government are one of them. Uh, we have uh, fourteen thousand properties that agencies have identified as excess, but there are additional fifty five thousand assets beyond that that have been classified as underutilized by agencies, but have not yet been placed in excess and therefore not in the queue to get to to be. Uh, to be gotten rid of. Um, and then I, I have concerns that beyond that 55,000, there are additional assets uh, that have not been scrubbed closely and looked at for realignment opportunities. The process that we have today is uh, somewhat bureaucratic. Um, there is a surprise. Yeah. Um, the, uh, there, are, there are three problems uh, with our uh, process for getting rid of property. The first is red tape. And um, uh, unfortunately, every property, whether it is a, uh, a warehouse in a rural location or an office building in a downtown location that is no longer needed, needs to go through the very same process, which, uh, uh, depending on how good the agency is at doing it, could take anywhere from a year to two years, which is unacceptable in terms of the more uh, critical needs we have to not be maintaining these assets at a cost to taxpayers. Um, the second reason is incentives that uh, and, and financing. Agents, it costs money to relocate. It costs upfront money to uh, to get an asset ready for sale, and uh, and often we allow these these short term costs to to be a barrier to long term and broader savings. So we need to think about how to address that. And the third area is politics, um, and uh, we have found it uh, in many cases to be difficult to uh, remove the Federal presence from an asset that is underutilized uh, because uh, local officials or uh, congressional delegations rally around keeping that Federal presence there, even if there is an opportunity for realignment and, and consolidation. We looked um, at different uh, ways of addressing these three areas, and one area that we have had some success is in the uh, Defense Department's right. uh, base realignment and closure program, where by vesting the uh, process in an independent commission um, and giving them the flexibility and empowering them to make decisions uh, on, on bundled opportunities, uh, a lot has been done. All right. Let me give you, yeah. let me. I saw that in your report as well. Who are the individuals that you're currently recommending, and what's the process to try to pull that together? We don't have a. We, you know, ever since the president's budget came out, and we had this proposal in there, we've been getting contacted by uh, by commercial real estate experts and other community development experts around the country who'd like to participate. Right. We need we need legislation for this to occur. This is a a, a pro, you know, BRAC was. Uh, was put in place by legislation, this civilian realignment proposal would be the same. The moment we get it enacted, and I hope we get it enacted soon, uh, we will begin putting together this commission. We propose a seven-member commission uh, or seven-member board, um, and, uh, and, and we are already starting to gather names for that, but I think it would be premature right. to, uh, to get started before Congress acts. Let me just reaffirm that to continue to push on both us and for you to be able to think through this as well. Uh, it is a big issue for us to have this many properties that are sitting idle, underutilized or not utilized at all while we are dealing with such a budget deficit. That is a low-hanging fruit piece we should be pushing on and continue to move forward to get those things into the private sector. I would encourage you as well to continue to push on your 55,000 number. I am skeptical with you that that is all we have. Uh, based on the fact that you can look at, uh, I am in Oklahoma, if you look uh, 
to the west of Oklahoma, uh, almost all the country is owned or controlled by the Federal Government. Uh, when you begin to look west, there are a lot of properties and pieces that are sitting out there uh, that should be available to the public sector that are now very tightly controlled uh, by the Federal Government. So whether that is a building or whether that is property, uh, that when you start looking at, uh, we need to look at that. And as far as your red tape, I completely concur. I am a uh, freshman that is here, and when I walked in my district office, there is an IBM Selectric typewriter that is sitting there that has apparently been there for a very long time that they are trying to work out of inventory and it has taken forever to get a typewriter out. So I can only imagine what it is going to take to get a building out. So press on and we will try to help where we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Langford. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for these hearings. And let me echo what uh, my uh, colleague, Mr. Cooper, said. I think this actually is one of the most important hearings we could have. Uh, if you want to get a handle on the fiscal situation of the Federal Government. And I want to express my shock at learning that C-SPAN 3 is not here. Uh, uh, but uh, let, me, let me just pick up on the last point that our colleague, Mr. Langford, was making on property, because I have had experience, actually, in, uh, in my jurisdiction of uh, acquiring uh, excess Federal property. And one of the concerns, I guess, I would have is the valuation of that property. Uh, I think you mentioned, Mr. Dodaro, a figure of something like $2.5 trillion estimated assets held by the Federal Government. Uh, whatever the number is, uh, you know, in local government, we value property based on highest, best use. So it is one thing to say X property is, is excess, and if we decide that that is going to go to Oklahoma City as a park, that has one value. If, on the other hand, we decide, no, we are going to actually develop it as a research uh, park with office buildings and lots of workers, well, that has a very different value. And I guess I would be concerned about how we value property and when we dispose of excess property, talk about politics, that from the Federal Government's point of view, if we really mean it about the fiscal situation and addressing it, we want to sell it or dispose of it for the highest, best use, not the lowest use. And that, I assure you, is not so easy. Uh, with the best of intentions, it is not so easy. Would that not be correct, Mr. Werfel? It is. In fact, one of the questions that I, that I sometimes get when I raise this issue of why politics can prevent the assets is, say, well, if you have an asset that is mostly empty, why would the, the local jurisdiction uh, have concerns? And it is really about um, what happens to the property afterwards? It is the competing stakeholder interests that emerge, whether someone wants it for a park or someone wants to develop it commercially or someone wants it uh, gifted to a local university for education purposes, all noble objectives. The problem is those competing interests come into play and there isn't a rational process to reconcile them. Right. That is why this independent board, uh, we believe, is the correct solution, because it would be empowered to move quickly to determine what the right impact is for the community, for the taxpayer, and, and reconcile all those issues in a, in a condensed period of time and reach a decision. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dodaro and or Mr. Gregg, um, improper payments, uh, in terms of $125 billion a year estimated, right? Uh, what is the scale in terms of or the ratio between military, uh, Pentagon improper payments and civilian agency improper payments? I believe most of the $125 billion are civilian agency payments, half of which are in Medicare and Medicaid, uh, although in Medicare the Part D prescription drug program does not yet have an estimate, so that will have to be added in the future. Uh, the DOD one is relatively uh, low. Of the $125 billion? I believe so. Hmm. Um, let me ask about the 75-year projection. I, I was just thinking. 75 years ago was 1936. The idea that we can project 75 years into the future with any accuracy and anticipating actions by a Congress, by a series of presidents, uh, by the public, uh, technology, I mean, think about, think back 75 years and ask oneself how accurate would we have been in 1936 and predicting 2011. And so I guess I would ask you to comment on how valuable is a 75-year time horizon really? Well, I, I think it is very important, recognizing there are a lot of uncertainties and inherent difficulties in doing it, for the government to have a longer-term view of some of its policy decisions at the time. 
you know, one of the concerns that we've had is, you know, if you look at just the next budget year or even five years out, you really don't understand uh, comprehensively the long-term consequences of policy decisions. So I think some things have to be there. In some of these areas, we know the population is already here uh, and will turn a certain age at a certain period of time. So there is relative certainty to some of the assumptions in the estimates. Now, whether it is 75 years, 30 years, 20 years, the importance is to have a longer term perspective of it. So, General Dodaro, I, I would agree with yeah. you, but I think 70, I, I, I would suggest 75 years may be so long as to be meaningless, uh, very misleading in terms of, I mean, if you look at, for example, demographics, uh, and if you looked at a 75-year time horizon, I assure you, what demo if, if demographic projections were profoundly inaccurate in terms of population estimates and fertility rates and human behavior uh, and spacing of families, for example. And so I, I, I just think that, yes, I agree with you, we need a, a longer time horizon, but 75 may be not the tool we hope it to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, Ms. Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm just, <laughs> I, I, I would just like to, to add to what my uh, colleague said about 75 years. Um, I think 75 years is dangerous. <laughs> uh, when it comes to things like Social Security and Medicare, population based, perhaps so. But there will be people here who fasten upon such a figure as if it were the Bible. <laughs> Uh, because that is what numbers uh, can do to people. Uh, it makes you look like fortune tellers. And I think the reason your report uh, has credibility is uh, that it is so far as you can tell, uh, so far as you can humanly do science-based. Uh, uh, the, the, the configurations, uh, uh, even the best of you say five years out, even 10 years out, and even <laughs> It are wildly off base, so I would like to, I, I would like to also um, uh, um, see a spike put in 75 years, as if that is something anyone could rely upon, uh, except for uh, population-based notions, which turn out to be more accurate than perhaps some others. Uh, I note in the uh, at page 12 of the GAO report uh, a little. Uh, talked about a uh, notion of the government's return on some of its investments. Uh, at page 12, it says, in December 2007, the United States entered into what has turned out to be the deepest recession since the end of World War II. Gross domestic product fell 4.1 percent from the beginning of the recession through the second quarter 2000. Nine, then, then you note that uh, GDP has grown slowly, unemployment remains at a high level. Uh, in the second paragraph, you note the economic recovery that the government's actions to stabilize the financial markets and to promote economic recovery resulted in assets of 400 billion dollars, which is a net of about 75 billion in valuation losses. Now, this is a very little talked about notion. We always hear about uh, what, of course, is most prominent, and that is what the government uh, loses. Um, what would you, would you elaborate on? Um, um, this recovery of some of these assets, uh, break them down. Um, many, many would be surprised, perhaps in a shorter period of time than anticipated. Page 12. Yeah, oh, excuse, no, it is in the, uh, the management discussion analysis that is prepared by Treasury and OMB. It is not, it's not our report, so they may have uh, some well, Whoever wants to discuss questions. it, okay. be my guest. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, Congressman, I'll, I'll uh, share at a very high level. Uh, I think we are going to have to get back to you on some of the specific breakdowns of the assets. Uh, I happen to know that the Federal Government has purchased, to, according to our report, $225 billion in uh, mortgage-backed securities. We have $75 billion back in principal and interest. We have made $387 billion in TARP disbursements and been repaid $204 billion. I think the, the important point here is that some of the investments in particular that the Treasury made uh, as part of our Economic Recovery Act, either, either through the HERA legislation or the ESA legislation, were, uh, were set out with an expectation of a return, uh, where money is paid back to us or investments that we are made provide value to us that improve the bottom line associated with these financial statements. And I would agree that it is a point that, that, that sometimes gets lost when, uh, when the uh, TARP bill was passed. It was uh, widely reported, $700 billion was authorized, and I think there was a notion um, at that high level that that $700 billion was gone. But as it turns out, and as it is playing out, and as it is reported here, that, uh, that $700 billion is not the cost of that legislation, uh, and it is it's remarkably uh, uh, lower than that. Uh, and part of that is due to the fact of uh, being repaid, and part of that is due to the fact that investments that were made by the United States uh, are, have, continue to have value, and in some cases the government and the taxpayer actually have made a profit on those investments. Mr. Gregg? We can uh, get back to you with a, a more full description, but yesterday Treasury announced that uh, they had a repayment from AIG of $6.9 billion, and, and right now we have 70 percent of the amount that we have uh, gone out and in, in investments have been repaid. And the quote is that uh, we are looking to have little or no money actually for for those types of investments actually cost the taxpayers anything. So the money has been coming back through, uh, through those investments in AIG and, and other uh, en entities that, that we have had under management. And, you know, it is a con continuing process, but good progress has been made. Well, I, I, I must say I think it is a disservice not to report to the American people uh, who were very concerned, and rightly so, that the government had to lay out so much money not to report every jot and tittle of every cent we have gotten back, uh, every amount we ha may have made over uh, what we expected and in what period of time. You know, for those who read deeply into the newspaper, frankly, to get back as much as we have gotten back in so short a, a period of time turns out to be a big surprise and one of the best kept surprises uh, of this recovery. And I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. And if the witnesses would work with the gentlelady for any specifics, additional information that she, she's looking for, um, we need to wrap up in about eight or nine minutes. Uh, I'm going to try to get through a couple more questions here for those who have. Um, I'm, I'm going to kick it off on a specific issue. And, and this goes to a frustration I hear from constituents often that when we have um, either wrongful conduct in the Federal Government or just mismanagement, there is never any consequences. And, and one of the three major impediments identified by GAO to a clean opinion was the inability of, of so many of our Federal agencies and departments to adequately account or reconcile intra-government payments uh, between agencies. Um, you know, in uh, in uh, um, General Dodaro's uh, statement, um, there is referenced uh, that Treasury and OMB require our 35 largest agencies, our CFOs, to quarterly do that reconciliation. But as uh, the General's statement says, a significant number of these uh, entities did not adequately perform those reconciliations for fiscal years 2010 and 2009. Um, I guess uh, one question is, uh, General Dinero, I don't know if you have with you today, but what is a significant number? How many of those 35 did not adequately do it on a curly basis? And then specifically to our Treasury and OMB witnesses, what, if any, consequences occurred regarding those CFOs' failure to comply with your department and agency requirement? Was anyone disciplined, uh, suspended, fired? for not doing what they are required to do, because when they don't do this, as, as GEO is telling us, this is one of the major impediments to us fully understanding 
what is going on and getting a clean opinion, um, yet we have a significant number of agencies not complying with the uh, OMB and Treasury. So I guess, first, General Dodaro, if you, if you have a number. I, I can provide the specific number. Mr. Gregg might actually know yeah. uh, the, the specific number, but I couldn't agree with you more that there ought to be consequences. Yeah. And Ms. Gray, I don't know if you know, of the 35, how many agencies or departments of those 35 did not comply with the quarterly uh, reconciliation? Well, the, the, uh, I, I don't know offhand, but the, the thing that, that has been missing, uh, I alluded to before, is that, that uh, what happens is that agencies do business and, and they may not be, uh, one agency may not identify uh, when, when a trade comes in that actually what it is. And so our job at Treasury now is that we have taken this on is to build some kind of a system where we make sure that, that they can easily identify that they are talking about the same transaction. And then the role that I have also agreed to take on is that we are going to be following up with the agencies. And if they don't get those reconciled quickly, we are going to be after them and, and we will elevate it as high as we need to in the agency to get those taken care of. We can't, we can't do this once a year and be successful. This has got to be an ongoing process that we, and it is not just quarterly, it is it's, it's an ongoing transaction process that we need to stay on top of. And, and we haven't been doing it, Treasury hasn't been doing it, no one has been doing it as sitting in, in, the, in the seat of being responsible and holding the agencies responsible. Well, and, and that is my point here, is, is accountability. Right. Um, is that is what the American people expect of us. And if we have rules in place, that are to seek that accountability, and those requirements are not then followed through on, uh, there have to be consequences so that we send that message. Because if we are to get, and, and you know, this is across uh, all agencies and departments, um, you know, that they understand that the personnel understand that if they don't do their jobs, there will be consequences for their failure to do their jobs. Right. And, and uh, it sounds like we have not had consequences in the past, but Treasury is trying to put in place a system to allow more stringent requirements and consequences to be imposed. Is well, we, we, Treasury does, the uh, Financial Management Service does send out a, a report after each financial re, uh, report comes in and, in, in essence, kind of grades the agencies on how they did. The CFOs at the agencies don't especially appreciate getting that. Uh, is that report uh, given to the head of the agency as well? It's, it's given to just the CFO, the uh, highest if, level. If I can make a suggestion, that that report of you know, you know report card, since it's the CFO that has this responsibility, and you're giving him or her their own report card. Well, as a parent, I want to see my child's report card to hold them accountable. Let's make sure the agency head sees that report card so they can hold their CFO accountable, because otherwise. You know the fox is guarding the hen house. So um, you know I, I, I have great respect for our CFOs in the work, but if they're not doing a good job, their agency head needs to know it. So if if you can follow up with me um, on that request, that Treasury look at that change in how you distribute the information um, to the agency head. So. I'll do that. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I would say Treasury is in a difficult position because they are on a peer level. So I think your idea is exactly right. It really, OMB, on behalf of the President, or the President has to send a direction to the agency heads to get yeah. this, to get that, this that's solved. That is a very important point. And, and uh, if we can uh, have OMB's uh, engagement on this as well to, to partner with Treasury and this subcommittee. Uh, that we really have consequences. Again, this is one of the three main criteria that is highlighted as why we can't get a clean opinion. And, and so I think it has got to be one of the issues we are most serious about going after. Yeah, and I agree. And I think alerting the agency head of some of these key metrics is something we are certainly interested in doing, and, and we will work with Treasury and, and you on that. The other thing I would just add is that I, I do think there is a, a positive development that has occurred over the last five years of more and more a demand from OPM uh, for quantifiable metrics in uh, Federal employee performance evaluations. And in the CFO realm, we have a treasure trove of quantifiable metrics to hold CFOs, not just the CFO themselves, but their entire teams. And, and so I can't sit here and say that, that all the right people 
are, are seeing all the right impacts on their performance evaluations due to some of the weaknesses that we see. But I can tell you that it is, it is getting better and it is entering into the fray. Well, and that, getting that treasure trove of information to that CFO's superior is, is I think, what I am asking in this regard specifically, uh, so that we, we can do, uh, do a better job. Uh, I have other questions, but I don't know, Mr. Towns, if you have I anything just have, else. I just have a very quick one, you know, uh, as we talk about, you know, um, how does the IG play in this? I mean, the point is that it seemed to me that they could provide some technical assistance here that might help us. Do they have a role in any way? Uh, that, uh, Congressman, the IGs have a central role, and ultimately the IGs are responsible for the uh, financial statement audit element, the audit element. The IGs often contract with independent audit firms, although they don't all do that. But the IGs are overseeing the audits of their agencies uh, and therefore are our central partner in helping figure out what the financial management weaknesses of the agency are and how to address them. Uh, so, so they do play a central role. It's just, it just so happens that they don't always write the audit report. Sometimes they hire a, an independent uh, auditor to write the audit report for them, but they bless it and they have to sign off on it. All right, thank you very much. Because I think that is very, very important. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Dr. Gosar? Real quickly, gentlemen, are the Federal Reserve numbers accurate to your understanding in the terms of the accounting method? I believe they have an independent audit done uh, and that the numbers, uh, we don't have any basis to question the numbers at this point. I would add, though, that due to legislation in the Wall Street Reform Act, we now have at GAO broader responsibilities to audit the emergency lending facilities uh, at the Federal Reserve. We are doing that now and expect a report by this summer. Wonderful. Um, can I just follow up with a real quick question then? Do these accounting issues impact monetary policy like quantitative easing at the Federal, level, federal um, Reserve level? The, just to clarify, I mean, the Federal Reserve is, is really not included I understand. In, in the report. Yeah. So I, I, I would say, uh, you know, we, we at GAO are statutorily prohibited from reviewing monetary policy gotcha. issues. Thanks. And I, I would, Mr. Chairman, if I might add, just on the 75-year question that came up early, I just wanted to clarify for the record that the trustees, Social Security and Medicare trustees, are required by law to use the 75-year number. Yep. Uh, and I, I'm going to close with two quick questions just to make sure my understanding is correct before we adjourn for the joint session. Um, on Medicare Part D, um, when we talk about improper payments, Medicare, Medicaid, half of that $125 billion number. It is my understanding that when we look at the Medicare Part D, and, and um, Mr. Warfel, you referenced that it, the improper payments uh, rate is going down, Medicare Part D currently is not part of that number, uh, that they are not been assessed for what improper payments are. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. I was referring to Medicare fee-for-service and Medicare Part C. Both of those have separate error rates and both of those have declined, although yep. they are still at unacceptably high levels. We are in the process of developing an error measurement for Part D. Yeah, and, and, and given the size of Part D, the importance can, of yes, that. Yes, you can anticipate that, you know, given the size of the outlays, even if, even if we somehow achieve a 1 percent error rate. We are talking billions. Still, still talking big numbers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and on that, uh, the issue of Medicare Part D, you know, we currently have in law um, a 30-day payment requirement. Uh, for Medicare uh, payments. Uh, is that something that is given a, a billion transactions that Treasury is handling and, and the, the, the number that Medicare is handling? Are, are we, by having that 30 day payment requirement, which we want to pay providers as quickly as possible, but given the volume, is that too short to better ensure accuracy and, and, um, and the honesty of the claims we are paying? It is it's certainly something to look at. I mean, one of the, the goals of the improper payments legislation is to understand the root causes of these errors and understand what kind of adjustments need to be made. And if there is a sense that, uh, that the timing is too short to do the necessary due diligence, that should come in HHS's financial report and be reported out. And then we would want to talk to you about those types of statutory changes. But I think we need to certainly evaluate that as we go forward in terms of that timing. Um, thank you, and, and um, I, I certainly appreciate 
all three of you, your, your service to our nation uh, and your expertise in this area. We look forward to partnering with you as we go forward. Um, and just one uh, caution or reminder, uh, if we are talking next year about this, and uh, at least for one more year, I, I believe I will be the chairman. I, I don't know about it after that. Um, <laughs> But uh, if, if we see as one of those ma major impediments being intra-government payments, I am going to be asking, what did we do with that CFO report card where there wasn't adequate compliance on a, at least a quarterly basis and, and that we are going after that issue? So just to put you on, on fair notice. So um, we will keep the record open for, uh, for seven days for any other uh, additional information from witnesses or from member statements. Uh, and uh, our thanks to our witnesses for being here. This, uh, Hearing stands adjourned.